What do you think we should do? Mm, I don't know. How about we get some volunteers? All right, singers, let's grab some volunteers to help us get in the mood. Come on. Don't be afraid if they pick you. Please go to the front and assist our song service. You'll be standing right at the very front, right at the bottom, just like in our children's church. You get picked, just go and have a smile and let's have some worship. Quickly, song service, let's go. Hey, if they're not here in the front, if they're not here in the front, let's go. We only need a handful of people. Let's go. Come on. Who we got? Who's left? Who's left? All right. All right. If, you are, if you're one of the helpers that's helping us, please stand in the front. You can get in the front. We're going to restart our song service. Let's put some energy in it, guys. Let's have a good time tonight and worship God and praise him. Go ahead, Kaya. Okay, let's sing this first song, King of the Jungle. Who's the king of the jungle? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Who's the king of the sea?
you for the people of front who are doing the moves. Let's, you, you, you can go back to your seats now. Let's get into an attitude of worship as we sing this next song, Holy and Anointed One.
Let's give God a clap. Father, we thank thank you, you, God. We love you. Lord, we worship you. We give you all the praise. Amen. We're going to go before God in prayer. We're going to believe God for our fellowship leaders. We're going to believe God for Pastor uh, Tom Payne. And we're going to believe God for this conference. Okay, it's our first conference. I would like everybody to join me in prayer. And as we open up in prayer, Brother Mark's going to come to the mic and open up. So let's all pray together. Father, we thank you this evening, God. We are believing in you, God, for miracles, God. We are believing in you for you to be with us, God, this week. Lord Jesus, we come before you this night, God. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come and hear your word. We lift up this conference. We lift up each service. God, each lesson that would be given would be anointed, God, that we would take this back to our churches, Lord, the inspiration that you would put into our hearts for our children for the next generation to come, God. We pray your blessing and anointing upon everything that would take place this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Hello everyone, we would like to welcome you to the Kids in the Kingdom Builders Conference. Tonight, I have some exciting announcements for you. Let's start with our name tags. If you haven't made yours, please do so in the foyer. The name tag will tell us who you are and will give you a ticket into the prize giveaway. Also, tomorrow's seminars start at 9 a.m. with 8 a.m. prayer. Don't be late and you don't wanna miss our 5 p.m. service with 4 p.m. prayer. This is where our Children's Church comes alive with a black light special from the Royal Ruppets. You don't want to miss it. Well, that's it for now. I hope you enjoy the conference. See you later. Bye. Amen. I'm going to get set up here. And so how many of you guys excited tonight? All right. Hang on there, Larry. Larry's excited. We know Larry's excited. All right. So I have the privilege of picking up or receiving, rather, the first offering for our first children's ministry conference. And so, so as you guys know, children's church offerings are different than big church offerings, right? So... What, I have a little bit of preparation here to do. Okay, so I got to get my stuff here ready. All right, and so how many of you guys excited to give tonight? All right, so when we're excited to give, then we come prepared, right? And so... It's one thing to be excited to come to conference. It's another thing to be excited to give. And so what I want to talk to you guys about is when we give, when we're prepared to give, God moves in our finances. God moves in our money. But when we're not, it's very hard for him to move. And so there's a scripture that specifically talks about God, uh, God telling us that if we give, something supernatural will happen. And so if you don't know what supernatural means, for all the younger audience, supernatural is when God does something awesome, something that we can't do on our own. God does something big, right? And so... I want to read you guys a scripture, Malachi 3.10. I think I gave that to them, right? Maybe I did. Yes, there it is. And so Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and test me. Wait, did you just say test? I've been waiting for to test God. I've been preparing my notes. Look, I even have a test. I've been preparing all my you life. You wrote a test for God? Yeah. No, 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 no. That's not what I, I know you. 
I know you really like teaching and want to be a teacher, but that's not what testing means. How many of you guys came ready to take a test? No? So that's not what, the, that's not what it means when God says, test me. Let me see if I can find a volunteer to help me. Who wants to volunteer tonight? Raise your hand if you want to volunteer. Raise your hand. Okay, we don't have a whole bunch of Okay, actually, I need somebody, somebody to volunteer that actually came prepared to give an offering. So if you came prepared to give an offering, and raise your hand. Okay, Damien, come up here. So, so you came prepared to give an offering? Yeah? How much did you bring? I know we're not supposed to ask, but it is Children's Church, right? We can, we can bend the rules a little. You brought 20, he brought a $20 offering. That's pretty good, right? So our scripture says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. The tithe, your money, right? Give to God. God's going to move. Do you believe if you give, God will move in your finances? God will move in your money? All right? All right, well, give tonight. So tonight he's chosen to give. He's chosen to trust God. And when you do that, something supernatural happens. Now get, pull your money out. What? What is that? $50. $50 just like that? Your 20 turned into 50? So that's what happens when you give. God is able to move supernaturally. All right, well, take your money and go. All right, let's give him a hand. How many of you guys, how many of you guys want that to happen to you in your finances? Want to give? And want God to move. But the scripture, there's more to the scripture. The scripture then goes on and says, test me, test me in this, says the Lord. Um, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out, a, a, pour out so much blessing that there's not room enough for you to store it. Now, getting blessed in your finances is one thing. But so much that you can't store it, that's where we should be getting excited tonight. How many of you guys are ready to give now? Okay, you're not ready. So let me show you guys. So I have a little demonstration. All right. We're going to have to pull out all the tricks tonight. This represents your money. This represents the offering. And this represents God's blessing. Okay, what does God's word say? It says, give, right? So we give. Oh, no, but I don't have that much. I just have a little bit. Okay, just give. And then his word says, this is a big pulpit. His word says that he will pour out for you a blessing. Right? So look at the little bit that you gave, and then look at what happens. So God will pour out a blessing, but then something happens. If we don't give no more, it can't continue to grow. So God says, if you pour out a bless, if you if you give, you continue to give and be faithful then I'll continue to pour out my blessing upon you. And eventually, you won't have enough room to contain it. How many of you guys want that to be your life? So, if you, I appreciate everybody clapping for my object lesson. But what we need is we need an offering in the basket. So, I'm going to challenge you, trust God. You can trust God when you're 5, you can trust God when you're 10, or you can trust God when you're 50. God's word never changes in this area. And so we're going to give tonight. So we're going to pray, and we're going to believe God to give this first conference offering. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us to be here. God, we are believing in you for the next generation. God, we pray that tonight you would pour out a spirit of liberality and that every person that would give, God, that you would bless their finances and that this would become real in their lives. 
And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all give it a cheer for her and sing the song Phil Phil. to have a treat. Our own Pastor Jeremy Moreno, when, pa when me and Pastor were talking about who could come and preach at our first Children's Church Conference, immediately I said, Pastor Jeremy. Pastor Jeremy has not only been a Children's Church kid, but he has been a Children's Church helper. And as soon as him and his wife got married, they became Children's Church teachers. And he wasn't just a teacher for a little while, just passing through. But he really had a heart for the kids, and he really enjoyed uh, doing children's church. We did our first uh, Harvester's Play together, and it was awesome. I think he was only 17, and he was already married. But um, let's give him a hand as he comes up and ministers to us tonight. Thank you, Robert. Hello, my name is Jeremy, and I'm a recovering children's church worker. <laughs> What Robert didn't say is that the kids would have a uh, vote every year, and uh, not to brag, right, humbly. I got teacher of the year every year. <laughs> no, thank you, Robert, for the invitation. Thank you, Pastor, for trusting me behind this pulpit for this, our very first Children's Church Conference. It really does take a heart for kids, a heart for this ministry. Uh, I loved it. Like he said, it was one of my favorite. It was my first ministry in church ever. And it was my favorite ministry. Once I became a teacher and they give you full access, full range, they give you the kid, the, the keys to the kingdom, or here the kid, keys to the kids of the kingdom, And, you know, and I had a blast. I would have so much fun uh, being in there. Uh, I would pray for pastors that would preach long so I could be in there as long as possible. And uh, I only got out because uh, I became door director, so I couldn't do it anymore. Um, so I do have an insight into what we do as a children's church, as a kid, as a helper, And as a teacher, and now as a pastor, seeing the effects of what Children's Church can do for our kids, I think is something special. So in thinking of that, I wanted to preach something um, I pray and I hope that is encouraging, but also that you would open your heart tonight and examine and analyze why you're in this ministry, why you do what you do, and what you can take out of this. When you leave from here, you need to ask God, God... How much more can I give of myself, or what are you asking of me to impart into these kids? I'm going to be ministering out of the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. 
They told me I didn't have a time limit tonight, so I hope you had a good dinner. Speaking of that, let me put my timer on because then there'll be people in the back going. I want to preach a sermon I've entitled Raised in God's House. Raised in God's House. And I want to talk about the prophet who had, before he was a prophet in the Bible was referred to as the child Samuel. The story of Samuel is unique. It's very literal to what we say we do nowadays, what we do spiritually and theoretically, he's, his family did physically. His mother, Hannah, his father, Elkanah, they couldn't have kids. And the, Hannah would pray and ask God for a miracle. She would ask God, God, all I want is a child. She would pray so hard and so much that they thought she was drunk in church. You ever prayed so hard they thought you were drunk? If it's not true, then you're not praying hard enough. Oh, that's a free one. Finally, God answers her prayer, her fasting. God answers her, the cries of her heart. All the years of waiting, he gives her a child. And what she does is she brings him back to God's house and releases her only son into the hands, yes, of God, but physically into the hands of the church, into the hands of the temple and the, the priest Eli. She came, dropped them off. You know, this isn't a, here, here's one diaper, or one bottle, I'll be back after service. This is, here's my son for life, take care of him. And I thought of that as soon as I was thinking about what to preach. I thought of that and I said, man, that is incredible. That is what we as a church are doing. That parents come and they may not leave your, uh, uh, hey, pastor, you know, raise my kids. You know, I hope you got some cots up there, you know, boot camp style. But parents come and they entrust us, they bring their children so that we can teach them, so that we can show them, so that they can build a relationship with God. And they bring their kids to children's church and they entrust you and say, here's my son, here's my daughter, please raise them to know God. That's heavy. We should feel the weight of that responsibility. We should feel the weight of that. Uh, th that should weigh heavy on our shoulders. I was reading up on uh, Spartan, the Spartans. How many have ever seen those? Not the movie, but you know about them. Oh, yeah, Pastor, I saw the movie. Well, get saved. <laughs> the Spartan traditions and their whole culture is very fascinating. They're very disciplined people. Their whole mindset was uh, uh, based on military. It was a military-based society where military had the highest positions. As it goes, as you're reading, some of this is not verifiable, right? But it's good for the sermon. They said that even as babies, the general of the time, the reigning general and his highest-ranking captains, would get the babies at birth and dip them in wine... And depending on their reaction, they would determine how strong the baby was. And that baby would either, either be labeled a slave or a Spartan warrior. Imagine that, a baby. You don't have control of anything. And they're deciding your future. Imagine if the nursery workers had to decide the future of your kids based on the size of their diapers. It says that in this society, the Spartan boys at age seven years old were turned over by the parents to the state. They were given to them. Here, here's my son. He's no longer mine. They release claim. They would release hold. That child now belonged to the Spartan society. And they were organized into companies and lived and studied and trained together in a facility until the age of 18. And at age 18, they were began, uh, uh, sent out to uh, survive. And uh, uh, there's a, I'm not going to go into all the stuff they did to fight. But I want to focus on that the parents would leave them. At seven years old, you're saying goodbye for the last time, giving your kids over to learn how to be warriors. That's incredible. We know that Spartans are famous because their military was so organized, so disciplined, and so strong that just a little bit of them, 300 of them, could defeat 
armies of hundreds of thousands. That as this story that we're going to read about Samuel, that the effects and the results of being able to trust someone with your kids, that parents that come and leave their kids with us, we should be training them, showing them, discipling them to be great warriors for God. It isn't just babysitting. It isn't just the time that uh, 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 you're counting down the clock, you know, uh, hope, uh, I hope Pastor Preach is short today, you know. I hope the lights go out so I can get out of here. That we are entrusted to teach, show, and be able to equip these young children. Because to God, they have a future and a destiny. And we are a part, as a church, as collective, as the body of Christ, we are to raise children. Children aren't just raised by one. The, there's a saying that says it takes a village to raise a child. Have you heard that? It takes a church to disciple men. Let's read the story here before we go on. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. It said, Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the, Lord, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And there was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place, when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see. And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, Here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call. Lie down again. And then he went and laid down. Then the Lord called yet again Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he answered, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went down and lay in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called as the other time, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. Let's pray this evening. God, I ask you, God, for your presence here tonight. God, I pray that your conviction, your Holy Spirit would be here present God, that there would be grace in this room, God. I pray that you would open up eyes, God, understanding, God, hearts would be softened, God. Give us a vision and a burden, God, for the future generations of our church, God. Give us creativity and a heart, Lord God, to be able to minister. We pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. And all God's people said, I want to look at, first of all, entrusting. And I have to start this off. I know I'm preaching to children's church workers, teachers, helpers. But there may be some parents here. I do want to mention this before I go any further. God has given parents a role to raise your own children. Oh, there ain't no amens there. I'll say it again. Maybe the mic's off, I think. God has given parents the role, the, the, the responsibility to raise your kids to know him. There you go. Parents should teach, instruct, correct, train up. Right? In Proverbs it says, train up a child in the way that he should go, that when he is older he shall not depart. Who's doing the training? Parents. Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7 says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. That God has placed a responsibility on every parent here to teach your kids through exampleship, through how you live, through how you talk, through your decisions, through your discipline, and through your relationship with God. We're supposed to teach our own kids about God. This isn't a uh, uh, parents, oh, finally, I don't have to live up to convictions. I don't have to, I can just give them the children's church. I can give them to the church and let them raise them spiritually. No, as parents, we have responsibilities. How many know that our children, everything God gives us 
He's lending to us. He's letting us be stewards over. Your kids are not even yours. God is allowing you to raise them. So we should raise them right. This isn't a call for parents to forfeit or neglect their duty to instruct their children in the ways of the Lord. Hannah was asking God for children and he answered. She loved her son. She, want, she was going to teach him about God. But she came and said, you know what? I need to give back. I need to put him where he belongs in God's house. She returns and leaves her son to be raised by the church. Talk about the ultimate tithe right there. I don't know about you, but I could preach all I want about releasing your kids. But once I had my daughter, if God came and asked me for my daughter, I'd just be like, hey, Pat, you know, God, let me pray and fast about it for a year and a half. Let me pray and fast till she's 18. Then I'll think about it. 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 27 says, For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worship the Lord there. This is where Hannah comes and drops him off. She literally comes, gives him to Eli, let him be raised there. She would only see him once a year when she'd come up They'd give their offerings and they'd come and pray as they usually did. That's the only time she would see him. All the rest of the year, he's been raised by a priest in the temple. Can I tell you that that is parents? That's what they're doing when they come to children's church. They're entrusting their kids in your hands. Can I tell you to raise a spiritual child, it takes two. It takes parents willing to let them go and someone willing to teach them. Yes, we can say that she was entrusting her son into God's hands, right? We always say that, God, I trust you into your hands, you know? Remember that song or, or that prayer that they teach us as kids? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. We're saying, God, in your hands is where I trust my family, my, my kids. But it's not just trusting God. We come to a physical place and you check in your kids and you put them into children's church. Here you go. Teach them about God. Show them the way. Eli was charged with teaching young Samuel, with, with molding him. Samuel became a man of God through Eli's care, through Eli's uh, uh, teachings, through his example. Eli had daily tasks. He would wake up and pray. He would uh, uh, organize the temple and, and all his priestly duties. And he would take Samuel with him. And Samuel would watch what he did. And, and Samuel would learn. He literally heard from God because Eli perceived this is God talking to him. Samuel did not know God's voice. He did not know what God sounded like. But Eli told him, this is God. So when he calls you, answer this way. Children need to be taught about God. Children need to be shown about God. Children need to see about God in others. 1 Samuel 2.11 gives us this insight. I love it because in chapter 3, if your Bible has a, a subheading... It should say, a child Samuel ministered before the Lord. We're not talking that he was young, that he was, you know, uh, some teenager. No, it says a child. Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli, the priest. I remember I was talking to a pastor, and uh, he was telling me, about a conversation he had. He said, I was talking to somebody, another pastor. And you know how pastors talk when they get together, you know. Holy and righteous things and godly things. They were asking each other, how many people go to your church? How many people go to your church? And so this guy asked them, hey, how many, how many do you got in your church? And he goes, oh, I got about 30 people. And he goes, yeah, 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 but how many adults? I don't count the kids. To this pastor, kids don't count. They don't matter. Can I tell you that God does care about kids? That when God sees a church, he doesn't just count the adults. He sees the children because that's the future of where we're headed. God loves them. God has plans for our kids. 
God has plans for the kids in your church. God literally, when he saw Samuel, he began to see something big. He didn't wait till Samuel was of age. He didn't wait till Samuel was 18 or, or uh, married or able to drive a car or hold a job. To God, Samuel was important at a child's age. God could have not, God could have waited to talk to Samuel till he was older, till he had more understanding or till he could do something. But God chose to speak to him. I want to talk to him that he's a kid. That's how important kids are in God's eyes. Our story really is here about a releasing and a receiving. Really, Hannah had to be able to trust Eli. She trusted God. She trusted the temple. But you had to be able to trust. The real question here tonight, and I want you to really hear this. The real question here tonight is not so much will parents release their kids because they'll bring them to children's church. But are you trustworthy of receiving those kids? Should they even trust you with what you're teaching, with how you teach, with how much you put effort into what you're teaching? I want to look at secondly here, Eli's discipleship. People can say that Children's Church is for parents to enjoy the service. Let's take care of the kids while the parents get ministered to. Can I tell you that Children's Church is so much more than just babysitting? We're not here to teach you just, you know, how to distract kids for 45 minutes. This isn't a, uh, a, 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 a trick show and a, a smoke screen where here, look at these tricks that we have. Really, what Children's Church is, is a spiritual opportunity for you to disciple young children. I think we can convolute the word discipleship. We can make it more complex than it is. You know, what it is, if I were to ask, what is it to be a disciple? I would get answers like it's about Picking up chairs, Pastor. It's about being at outreach. It's about preaching. But the word disciple is really a student. It's someone who studies, someone who's learning. For there to be a student, there must be a teacher. Eli was teaching Samuel. Eli was discipling Samuel. Can I tell you that we in Children's Church... Maybe you're not called to preach. Maybe you'll never leave. Maybe you don't have that. But can I tell you that God is entrusting you to be able to disciple these young children, to teach them. Frank King from Tucson had a conversation years ago about what it takes to uh, be in children's church and what he views it. And he has an emphasis on having your pastor spirit, right? It's about discipleship, that we're learning from our pastor so that we can teach it to the children, that it's a church effort. Paul said this when he was uh, uh, out preaching and he was looking for men to take over the churches that he was starting. He said in Philippians 2.20, he says, I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. He's saying, I need someone who thinks like me. I need someone who knows where I'm headed. Can I tell you, a church is in the same way. Pastors are focused. They're hearing from God. They're going in a certain direction. Your pastor in your church is trying to take it somewhere. Do you have the same spirit to be able to transmit that to the children in your church? Do you have a drive and, and a, a, a mind and a heart that says, how do I get these children, how do I get these kids to understand God's will or, or where we're headed? How do I show them? How can I teach them? That's the fun part of children's church. Not the drag, not the burden. That's the fun part. How can I show them through skits? And, and, and uh, 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 as we saw here, Brother Robert doing uh, uh, the, the, the words of my mind. Not show and tell, but the, I was testing y'all, y'all passed. <laughs> it's to show them something. We know how God sees kids. My question is, 
How do you see kids? When you look at a kid, what do you see? Can I tell you that David, King David, how many would agree? You'd lift your hand and say, David is somebody great in the Bible. Is the mic not on or what? How many would agree King David was a great character in the Bible? A man after God's own heart. But David started off as a kid. And his own father counted him out. When Samuel, and and look who goes to pray for him. Samuel. Samuel goes, he's going to anoint the next king. And he goes to Jesse. Jesse, hey, you need to get all your boys together. God's going to pick one of your sons to be king. So he's, hey, go take a bath, go shave, go get ready, you know, do some push-ups, something. He gets all his strongest, smartest, tallest, uh, uh, whatever s kids he has. And Prophet Samuel sees the tall one. No, this has got to be it. He's tall, you know. And God's like, nope. And I'm, all the short people said, thank God, amen. <laughs> then he saw the good-looking one. Oh, this has got to be it. He's good-looking. And God said, nope. And all the ugly people said, thank God. (laughs) Don't laugh because, never mind. (laughs) And then he brought the strongest. And then he brought the smartest. And God kept saying, no, no, no. And he ran out of kids. And now Samuel's like, wait a minute. God, you told me one of his sons was going to be king. And Jesse, he's like, do you have any more? Well, yeah, I got one more. I didn't even bother telling him about it. In fact, he went to go take care of everything while all the boys are over here. He didn't even think about him. It was, some, it was an afterthought. J- David, he's just a mocoso. He's just a little kid. He's just a runt. And yet they call him, and he's the one that gets anointed king. And Samuel had insight because he was a child when God chose him. So he saw David, and God spoke to him and said, I don't look at the outside. I look on the inside. And he anointed a child king. And he probably went home and thought, wow, I remember when I was a kid serving in God's house. First Samuel 16, and Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. There he is, keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send him, bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes. So he sent him, brought him in, and he was ruddy and with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. What do you see when you see these pictures? What do you see when you see that kid right there? It looks like a bag of bones. (laughs) What do you see when you see that kid right there? What about that one? What about, I want you to focus on the guy in the back. They're doing a play, and he's over there leaning like a gangster, not even paying attention. And he actually did grow to be a gangster, so that's crazy. He was showing signs right there. And look at that guy, anointed right there. That's the. Go back to the first one. What do you see when you see these kids? Do you see Troublemaker? Oh, they're just giving me so much trouble. If I could just get them out. Do you see headaches? Do you see problems? Do you see boogers? Do you see cooties? Can I tell you that every single one of these pictures that we showed is now a pastor or missionary that has been sent out and is doing God's will because God saw those kids and said there's something special about them. What do you see when you look at the kids in your church? God sees potential. God sees destiny. God sees cities. What do you see? More work? Having to stay up late? Ah, I got Sunday. I got children's church on Sunday. Ugh. Ah, it's revival. I'm going to miss the best revival because these stinking fallen angels. And you can laugh, but you carry that attitude into when you go serve. You know, I've, taught, I've been in children's church. I was in there for years. 
I know what we feel and I know what it's like to have to encourage other children's church workers or even teachers. And one of the things that I always got from my fellow workers is they always feel like they're serving in obscurity. I got the ministry in the back. No one sees me. There's conferences. There's, there's harvesters. There's rallies. There's, there's all these events and I'm stuck back here. I can't even, and back then there was no live stream, right? Now you can take your live stream everywhere, you know, put it. You shouldn't, but I'm saying. Back then there was nothing. I remember workers would ask to go to the restroom or they'd go, oh, I'm going to go to the restroom. And they, they wouldn't come back for like 30 minutes. What are you doing? Oh, there's special music. I wanted to hear it. <laughs> if you view this ministry correctly, you will not see it as a bother. You will not see it as it robbing you from something. You'll see it as a privilege to raise the next generation. But your view needs to be correct. Your heart needs to be in the right place. Our story takes place where Samuel is, is hearing from God and he wakes up and, and he goes, wakes up Eli. It's taking place in the middle of the night. Now, I don't know about you, but having a daughter recently... Right? She's a year old. She's finally sleeping on her own. Thank God for miracles. I'm barely getting my sleep back. Can I tell you my sleep is precious right now? Eli is in the middle of sleeping, and Samuel's waking him up, right? You wake him up once, Daddy, Daddy, I had a nightmare, right? You ever had been woken up by your kids for that? Or your husband? <laughs> Eli's woken up, but he's like, you know what? Hey, I didn't call you. Go back to bed, right? And then Samuel does it again, and, and he wakes up, and, and, and he's startled, and he's all groggy, and he, he doesn't get mad. He doesn't yell at him. He, he's, he's confused. He's like, well, what's going on, kid? You know, go back to bed. You know, we're trying to sleep here. Eli was able to finally realize that it was a teachable moment and applied it to teach Samuel to hear from God. Can I tell you that serving in children's church is going to be full of moments where you're able to teach if you have the right attitude. And I'm going to tell you something that you're not going to like. Children's church is an inconvenience. <gasps> Pastor, what are you saying? I don't even want to look at Tim. He's looking at me weird. <laughs> children's church is an inconvenience. Can we be honest or no? Y'all are looking at me like, oh, you're so messed up, Pastor. It's true. It's an inconvenience. It's not always the ministry that we want or the place that we want. There's inconvenience. Kids will inconvenience you. Children's church is inconvenient. But can I tell you, it's so worth it if you're willing to push through it and serve. Eli kept getting woken up. He didn't yell at him and go sit down and shut up and, you're, you know, punish him. He, he was able to read between the lines and say, I can teach this kid something. I think God's trying to talk to him. Do kids come and ask you, teacher, teacher, who's David in the Bible? I don't know. Go ask your parents. Here's a side note. I don't know. I debated even saying this, but there's a lot of parents that are involved in children's church. And sometimes you can feel unqualified or disqualified or not able to, to do much because your own children are not in line or not saved or they're demons, right? How can I teach a kid to be good if mine are terrible? Can I tell you that Eli in the Bible was a horrible father? That his kids were out of order and ended up being taken care of by God? Yet he was able to raise up a man of God in Samuel. Don't let that count you out. Don't let that take you out. Children's church is our opportunity to invest in part discipleship into the next generation. I need you to leave from this place thinking, what am I imparting? What am I giving? What does my spirit give? What does my attitude give? What have I been giving these kids? I got to see uh, one of the, the ghost-looking kid that was there, the weird one that with all those patches. That's Pastor Eric Rivas. And I got to see him be a little kid in Children's Church. There, there he is. <laughs> and I told him I was going to use a picture of him, and he says, I can't imagine which one. There it is, Eric. 
I got to see him develop right before my eyes from a little kid running around. And in fact, he was wearing some of that makeup when he got some stuff dirty. Anyway, I forgave him already. But I got to see him develop and, and grow and go through our children's church and be discipled to the point where when I was the youth pastor here, he was my assistant for the youth. That was an awesome full circle for me. Instead of causing trouble as a kid, now he's causing revival as a missionary. I want to finish off here with connecting them to God. The whole point of this is when the parents come and entrust us their kids, our job is to be able to connect them to God so that they have their own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Isn't that what we preach to the world? Hey, hey, we're not a religion. We're a relationship. This isn't about religion here, brother. We have a relationship with Jesus. Well, that's awesome to tell people, but how do we teach that to our kids? Do we teach that to our kids? Or do we just teach them a set of rules? The things that we're asking of parents are costly and hard. But the result of Hannah dropping off her son, the result of Eli caring for him and raising him in discipleship, the result was that Samuel, a child, was able to have a real, direct, and personal relationship with God himself. That if we can apply ourselves and really get a hold of God, get his mind and his heart, get, get a burden for where God, God, what do you want? Where do you want these kids? What do you want me to teach them? If we can focus on getting God involved in what we do, we can connect them to God. Pastor would always say this, and when he disciples us here in the big church, he would say that. He's like, I'm not going with you to your city or to your nation. I'm not going to be holding your hand. I mean, he didn't hold our hand here, but you know what I mean, figuratively. He's like, I'm not going to be there step by step. You need to have your own relationship with God. And that was scary. I would hear Pastor say that because I would go to him for everything. Pastor, how do I do this? Pastor, how do I do that? And Pastor, and, and he, would, he answered, right? You're a disciple. You're learning. But what he was saying is once you get sent out, I'm not going to be there. I can't pick your church for you, the streets, the city. Pastor, where should I put my church? I don't know. I'm not there. We had to develop our own personal relationship with Jesus before we got sent out. That's what we're doing here for Children's Church. We're trying to get them to build a personal relationship with Jesus as they come out of Children's Church. They shouldn't just come out knowing how to play drums. Or, and by the way, that was an awesome song. Can, can we give them one more hand? That was amazing. We're not just teaching mechanics. We're not just teaching, you know, how to play drums, how to do lights, you know. We pride ourselves in what our kids can do. Well, they, you know, they leave children's church knowing how to move the knobs on sound. And they could, set, they could run a whole church service if they wanted to. It's not just mechanics. That's awesome that we're teaching them that. But have we taught them how to get a hold of God for themselves? Have we taught them the importance or how to pray? Have we taught them how to read the Bible? Have we taught them what to do when problems arise in their home, with their families? Have we equipped them to go to God in their times of need? In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 18, it says, But Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as a child wearing a linen ephod. Moreover, his mom... His mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer yearly sacrifice. So he's a little kid, and they got priest robes and the ephod. You know, he's dressing the part. He had the mechanics down. But Eli was able to connect him to God to have a personal relationship. Can we do that? Can we not just equip them? You know, this whole weekend... You're going to be taught how to, you're going to be equipped with tools to be able to teach kids things. But one of the things you should take away from this Children's Church Conference is a heart and a spirit and a prayer in your heart that says, God, help me to connect these kids to the living God. Help me to connect them to you because the only one that's going to help them in life from their future is you. First Samuel 2 26 says, and the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor both with the Lord and with men. We need a heart that says, God, help me 
to take these kids, love them as you have loved me, teach them, but also to connect them to you. I want to finish off here with this simple video. I got a hold of all of our missionaries and pastors that I could. Uh, There's some missing there, but that actually went through our children's church here in McAllen. Like back in the day from the back of the truck days. And I asked them some questions. And so I want to show this video here. Hello, McAllen. My name is Eric Rivas and my wife, Jordan. We are here as missionaries in the nation of Armenia. Just want to say congratulations on your first annual Children's Church Conference. I remember being seven years old in Children's Church, and there's many things I learned in there that have impacted my life till today. Most importantly, it taught me how to build a strong relationship with God. I remember countless biblical stories, illustrations, lessons on the importance of prayer, tithing, and world evangelism. And when it came to ministry, I remember being 10 years old, getting involved in the song service, eventually the drama team. And this is a, a time where kids and even preteens are so eager to want to serve God and serve their church. So I believe these ministries were a gateway on helping them express that passion and desire. Hey, McAllen, my name is William, and I'm here with my beautiful wife, Andrea Ryan. And we're here in, uh, we're pastoring here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And my wife and I, we've been in the ministry going on 10 years already. We pioneered in Little Rock, Arkansas, went back home in McAllen to assist, and then now we're here. And the truth is, you know, my wife and I, we're both um, products of children's church. You know, we grew up in church, and I remember um, till this day, you know, just how children's church played a, a role and had an impact in our lives. Uh, for me specifically, I remember object lessons. I remember um, uh, teachings and different things like that. And also, you know, I developed friendships in Children's Church, and I still have a lot of those friendships till this very day. And how about you, babe? Um, I definitely remember the puppets and the lessons that they taught us. Um, I remember learning how to worship, how to pray, and how to serve. So my mom started going to church when she was pregnant with me, so my childhood was in Children's Church. Um, I have so many good memories in Children's Church, but um, Children's Church was the place where I learned my convictions, how to have convictions. I learned the basis of Christianity, my foundations that I still hold on to to this day. Um, to me, Children's Church impacts the next generation by helping kids build their foundation to Christianity and teaching them you know, how to have personal convictions and be examples to others. Um, it's also a place where kids can go and build strong uh, friendships that will last a lifetime. Um, two of my best friends I met in Children's Church and we're still friends to this day. And those are friendships that will help you in your walk with God as you get older. Um, it's also a place I feel that fills the voids for kids that maybe don't have their mom or dad at home or don't have either parent at home. It's a place where they can go and see godly examples of a mom or a dad or even just a woman and a man of God. Um, it filled those voids for me when I was a child and it's still doing that to this day. So uh, I came into the church, I would think about three years old. Uh, I immediately went into children's church. Um, I learned a lot there about the Bible, a lot of Bible stories, things that I reference to today, just stories that were taught uh, by p plays and skits and stuff like that. I still remember those things. I learned a lot of the basics of Christianity, things like prayer and worship, uh, right and wrong. And so. Hello, everyone. My name is Beto. Hi, I'm Alani. Um, Children's Church was so instrumental on how I viewed the Christian life, how I viewed God. Um, as my mom was um, being ministered to in the main sanctuary, as the parents were being ministered to, me in the Children's Church, um, without realizing it, was I was growing and learning. Um, and it was setting such a solid foundation without me even knowing it about prayer, about Bible reading and scripture memorization. I remember two things specifically. Uh, one was during song service, uh, we would stand at the altar facing the children, uh, you know, the helpers, 
and during song service we'd be clapping our hands or uh, we'd be worship, uh, worshiping God, lifting our hands, teaching the children how to worship. And just seeing these kids, you know, their eyes closed, their hands raised, just singing, yelling, you know, a song just touched me so much. And another thing was when we would open in prayer, you know, just like in the big church, we would open in prayer in children's church. And so all the kids, they would get in one line and one by one, they would come to the mic and they would say their need, their prayer needs, you know, their children, they're kind of fidgeting around, they're moving while waiting in line and they get to the mic and you can't really hear what they're saying sometimes. Uh, but then when we all would pray, seeing these kids, you know, their hands like this, they're, they're crying out to God and that, that left such an impact in my life. Literal childlike faith that these children, even these children, God hears their prayers and they would pray for their, their parents. They would pray for their uh, grades in school. They would pray for the missionaries and the pioneer pastors. And those things really left an impression on me uh, when I was a helper in Children's Church. And as my wife said, that's really what is going to impact every generation of Children's Church that come after this one, is that the Children's Church teachers, even the helpers, the, the, the Children's Church workers, the object lessons, everything that is uh, being done in Children's Church is intentional because you're laying foundational truths in the hearts of these kids. And that's really what is going to impact every generation is we're preaching the Bible, be it through an object lesson, through some skit, through a puppet show, through special music during conference. We're laying foundational truths in these children that maybe some of them, you know, they're not going to grow uh, up as a Christian. Maybe some of them are going to uh, attend a different church or, and some will become a pastor. We don't know, but we're laying these truths in them. That when they're a teenager, when they're an adult, when they're older and they have kids, they will point back and remember there are these foundational truths uh, that were put in them about who God is, who Christ is, redemption, salvation. And that is what's going to make the most impact, leave them uh, uh, an impression in the hearts of every generation of children that come into Children's Church is you are laying foundational truths that they will carry with them for the rest of their lives. One of the greatest fears that we can have as parents and as a church is that we lose our teenagers to the world, that we lose our preteens to the things of this world, but I say, if we come together, if we have a right heart, we invest fully, we get a hold of God for these kids in our children's churches, we won't lose a generation to the world. We'll be able to connect them to God. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this evening. This is, for some, some churches, some people, a looked down upon ministry or a neglected ministry. But can I tell you, if you search the Bible, if you search God's word and see what he has to say about children, what he has, his view, the way he treated them, David being a young king, Samuel being a young prophet, Timothy being a young pastor, God, when he looks at these young kids, when he sees youth, he sees the potential, he sees the destiny, his heart goes out to children. He said that to his disciples, do not do not stop the children. Do not hinder. Don't let them come to me. 
My prayer is tonight that we would have that same heart as Jesus. God, let the children come. Let me, let me serve them with the right heart. Let me teach. Let me impart. Let me give. Let me study. Let me apply myself. Let me get in line, in tune with God. And, and let, me, let me get a hold of my own pastor's spirit so that I can impart that into the children. There's things that we have to do. We have to get right in our heart. We have to be aligned in our heart if we're going to make it. You have to be aligned with God and where your church is headed and where your pastor and his spirit is taking the church. You have to be aligned. Oh, but when you do, the places you'll go, the things God will do through you, the impact you will leave upon these young people, these young men and young women, these children, precious before the eyes of the Lord, you'll have made an impact. You'll have led them in the right way. I know I didn't preach a sermon on salvation, but before we go any further, this is the day of repentance. This is the day of salvation. If you're here tonight and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ in your life as your Lord and Savior, and you want to do that, you want to repent of your sins, I want you to raise your hand. Let me pray with you. Maybe you're a backslider. You, you go to church. You're a church member grew up in church, but if you're honest tonight with yourself, you're not right with God. Your heart's not right. If you were to die today, you don't know where you would go. You're uncertain. Why don't you make sure? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. If you want to come back home, backslide, you want to get right with God, you want to get your heart right, raise your hand. Let me pray with you. What better place, what better time than right now? If you're going to go forward, why not get your heart right? All across this place, raise your hand. Amen. I believe we all, we are saved. We have, God sees that hand. Amen. Who else? Who else would join this brave heart? If you raise your hand, can I, can you look at me? You want to come pray? I'm going to have somebody pray with me. Let's stand to our feet, church. And before you come to this altar, all I ask is that you would examine your heart and come before God. I want you to be honest. Say, God, expose my heart. Show me. God, I would get rid of the bad attitude, God. Search me and know me. Maybe you need to pray what David prayed. God, create in me a clean heart and put in me a right spirit. When it comes to serving in this ministry, when it comes to being involved and imparting, when it comes to ministering, when it comes to studying and learning and acting and all the things that maybe you don't like doing, ask God, God, give me a heart. Renew my spirit. I want to do this in a right attitude. Maybe you're already doing good. You give and you serve and you slave away. You make crafts and you do all these things. Praise God. But maybe what you need is discipleship spirit. Discipleship minded that these children can be discipled and taken before God. What you need is to connect them to God. Ask God to show you. Ask God to move in your life.
God, praise. Tell him how much you love him. Thank you, Lord. God, I thank you, Jesus. Touch us, Lord God. Use us. Change us, Father God. We come before you. We thank you. Amen. Can we trust you? Should they trust you? There's a lot of responsibility with this next generation. Could be the last one. Right? I don't even believe it. <laughs> I want it to be. God, come back already. There's a lot of responsibility, but when we get a hold of God, when we put ourselves, our right heart, our right spirit, when we're in line, the potential that can come out of Children's Church is incredible. And you guys had a heart, a heart in that, a hand in that. You won't be on stage, you won't be in the lights, but they'll remember that little room back there. They'll remember the back of the truck. They'll remember the hot rooms that, you know, Pioneer Buildings have these, <laughs> no AC, no fans, you know, saunas over there, but they'll remember they taught me about God. I got a calling when I was in children's church. I knew they let me preach. They, they let me, I met the, the uh, there's, I was talking to a couple they're on the thing. They met in children's church. He said there's pictures of them looking at each other. I was like, I knew it. There's people that we saw here that backslid and came back. Can I tell you, your investment doesn't go to waste. Even if they backslide, God will bring them back. They'll remember what they do. Let's give our all. Let's give our all and let's align ourselves with what God has. And I know there will be great potential. I mean, that's all I have this evening. Let's give it up for Brother Robert as he comes. Amen. How many of you guys appreciated that? He did a good job, right? Awesome. Praise God. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Remember, tomorrow we start at 9 a.m. with 8 a.m. prayer. So uh, please be, be here. We have brochures in the back that tell us about the lineup, the different classes, seminars that we're going to be uh, teaching. And so if you, can, uh, if you, you want to pick one of those up. Um, so we're all meeting in here. At 9 a.m., this is where we're going to start. And um, Omar's running. And tonight was uh, dressed up, but tomorrow uh, in the morning and tomorrow at night, it's just uh, casual, business casual. And so you guys can come relaxed. Um, also, uh, the puppets that we see in the front, those puppets are for sale. Those are built, they're made by hand, they're very good quality, they're sold for a fraction of the price of what you can buy one of those black light puppets for. And so we did that just to make it available and make it affordable uh, for the different churches. So if you, want, if you have a chance, look at that and it'll be a blessing. And so um, I think that's all for tonight. Uh, tomorrow we have a great lineup. It's going to be a great conference. And don't forget, Saturday night is going to be a blast. So you got to be here for that. And so as we close off in prayer, I'd like every head bowed, every eye closed. And Brother Justin is going to close us off tonight. God bless you.